will see an atomic bomb test in the South Seas and an unlikely menagerie shot into orbit, all in the name of progress. Other 1952 milestones include the funeral of England's King George VI, Richard Nixon's infamous checker speech, and the birth of an infant called the Muscle Baby in Paris. We'll see these newsreel stories and more, including the successful presidential campaign of Dwight Eisenhower and Oscar night with Humphrey Bogart, all on Year by Year, 1952. A 15-day battle of men against the sea enters its final phase, as a freighter flying Enterprise lies dead in the water at the mercy of the raging Atlantic. Listing at an 80-degree angle, the ship remains in the custody of her heroic skipper, Henrik Kurt Carlson, who clung to his post through days and nights of howling winter gales. But safe harbor for the Enterprise was not to be. Within 30 miles of the British coast, after the tow line had snapped, the sea strikes with renewed fury, and the valiant skipper and his ship are helpless victims of mountainous seas, whipped to a 70-mile gale. At times, she heels over almost horizontal. These are the final hours of a ship. It is the end. Captain Carlson leaps to rescue and adds his name to the sea's immortal. A joint session of Congress welcomes President Truman as he arrives to deliver his annual State of the Union message for 1952. The chief executive outlined his aims for a solution of the Korean problem and a final armistice. Also plans for aid to our needy neighbors. In addition to an encouraging report on domestic progress and a plea for the fair deal, he specifically warned the nation of threat of war and the increasing buildup of communist weapons in spite of disarmament hopes. The present session of the United Nations in Paris, we, together with the British and the French, offered a plan to reduce and control all armaments under a foolproof inspection system. This is a concrete practical proposal for disarmament. If the Soviet leaders were to accept this proposal, it would lighten the burden of armament and permit the resources of the earth to be devoted to the good of mankind. But until the Soviet Union accepts a sound disarmament proposal and joins in peaceful settlement, we have no choice except to build up our defenses. The world still walks in the shadow of another world war. Way back when, there used to be a saying, beware of the Greeks when they come bearing gifts. But if this is a sample of Greek giving, just count me in, boy, count me in. These young ladies of Athens figure to shape up in the Miss Universe contest at Long Beach, California in June. They are competing in the Hellenic capital to select the winning entrance for the final, which will include representatives from all over the world. These 11 girls were selected from many candidates from all corners of Greece. But out of the group emerges the winner, Miss Daisy Mabraki, who looks just as stunning in her evening gown as in her bathing suit. The runners-up deserve admiration, but for female confectionery, Miss Hellas takes the cake. The Air Force at Mather Field, Sacramento, gets a close-up of Masako Katsuro in action. Hailed as the world's foremost woman billiard player, she stages a one-man show, her first since arriving from Japan. Her cue artistry speaks for itself. She's full of tricks, too, this oriental queen of the pool table who married an American Air Force sergeant and came home with him to California. We'll take our cue from the Flyboys and say, Bravo, Masako! Westminster, queen of the dog shows, returns to Madison Square Garden in New York for its annual two-day stand. The 76th and dogdom's most fabulous pictures has over 2,400 canine blue bloods entered, broken down into 107 breeds. That's a lot of dog to put on, and that's a lot of great dame. Excitement gets so the fellow almost forgets to breathe when the judge looks him over for best in show honor. For man's best friend and for man alike, it's a tense moment. There are six finalists, winners in their breeds and working groups. The Doberman Pincher caught the fancy of the crowd and the judge, too. It took him only 15 minutes, shortest time ever, to select 
Rancho Dobie Storm as Best of Show. As the train bearing the body of King George VI arrives in London, hushed crowds stand mutely as sick members of the King's Grenadier Guards remove the casket before the sorrowing gaze of Britain's new queen, her mother, and sisters. It is a tragic moment for them. As the casket is born on the first stage of its trip to Westminster, only sobs break the complete silence of the trip. Following the gun carriage are the Dukes of Edinburgh and Gloucester, the late King's son-in-law and brother. Huge throngs line the streets, and the cortege approaches Westminster Hall. The casket is covered with the royal gold and scarlet standard, and as it reaches Westminster, the group of mourning members of the royal family are joined by Dowager Queen Mary, who, despite her 84 years, is present to say a last farewell to her son. As the body is placed upon the catafalque to lie in state, crowds begin queuing up for a last look at their sovereign. With shafts of light coming through the great windows, Westminster becomes for the moment a shrine of empire and the crown jewels a symbol of the Commonwealth, held together only by allegiance to the crown. Hundreds of thousands will have streamed by the catafalque before the king is laid to rest at Windsor Castle. It is a solemn moment in Britain's history as British subjects the world over mourn the man who may well become known in history books as George the Good. century setting at the Villa Lante, 60 miles from Rome, Italy's top style experts display their latest wares with an assist, we hasten to add, from some of Italy's prettiest mannequins. The net result is glamorous. The settings, the styles, the models are certainly an eye-pleasing trilogy. Quite a place for a holiday, which is what this morning dress is called. Holiday brings to mind a swim, and girls, how'd you like to go for a dip in a suit called Popcorn for the Fishes? Sounds corny, but there are honest and goodness kernels on it. But swim's over. Now time for fishing. And the Capri Fisherman is specially styled for you gals who cast a good line. And what gal does it? Capri Fisherman has a wraparound skirt. Hmm, leaves me with faded breath. When the sun is quite warm, a parasol is quite handy in more ways than one. This one's convertible. Presto, she now has a wraparound skirt. What will they think up next? Driving for a place in the fashion sun, Italy's top designers are giving Paris and New York a good run for the money. Two for the show. And for show purposes, this combination afternoon evening gown is designed to reduce weight in air travel by giving you two dresses in one. Here is fashion's latest flight of fancy. Hoping to give the axe to his youthful opponent, Jersey Joe Walcott gets in fighting trim at training headquarters in Atlantic City. Joe is keeping sharp so as to retain the world's heavyweight title he's already successfully defended. Deeply religious and also a great family man, he's a real champ to a real youthful admirer come to discuss ring strategy or something. Joe makes a big hit with youth and hopes to accentuate that word hit when he meets a youth called Rocky in the near future. Youth versus age, what'll it be? At his training camp in Grossinger, New York, the contender for Joe's title sets out for a workout. Rocky Marciano tunes up for the coming big bout in Philadelphia, where he'll match his youth and speed against the savvy and punch of the ageless Walcott. Road work over, he helps out with the chores. Pays to keep on the good side of the cook. The experts are picking Rocky to win, and then the experts aren't always right. We'll soon see. Still to come on Year by Year, may I have the envelope, please? Oscar night in Tinseltown, and the favorite films of 1952. In 1952, the most popular films were Singing in the Rain with Gene Kelly and Debbie Reynolds, High Noon, which starred Gary Cooper, and The Quiet Man, John Wayne. 
Hollywood turned down for the Oscar Award by the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. N.J. Bloomberg, president of Universal International Pictures, and Mrs. Bloomberg lead a parade of celebrities, including Mr. and Mrs. Jimmy Stewart. The night is bright with stars. Julia Adams is here with her husband to witness the presentation. Shelley Winters and Vittorio Gassman attend the 24th Annual Awards, as do Donald O'Connor and Mrs. O'Connor, and that grand old veteran of the screen, Charles Coburn. It was a year marked by fine films. Lovely Greer Garson accepts the award for Vivian Leigh and stands by to present an Oscar to Humphrey Bogart. Miss Leigh's award was for Best Actress and Mr. Bogart's for Best Performance by an Actor. The many excellent films produced during the year made a close contest. Congress is in session. The 49th American Bowling Congress gets underway in the Milwaukee Arena. And for 86 days, 91,000 bowlers will compete for cash prizes totaling almost a half a million dollars. This is the ABCs of sport, where the big word is the Reich. Ned Day of West Allis, Wisconsin is a hand on the alleys, and an old hand at making a trick seem as easy as ABC. Ned's on a two-ball course and right on the beam. Just watch him fly. China goes on. French pilots flying Americans pick up with the big guns left off, blasting communist divisions which had infiltrated French positions in the Hanoi Delta. With their backs to the sea, unable to escape, hundreds of Viet Minh rebels surrender to the French forces under General Salin, successor to the late Marshal de Latre de Tassigny. Over 4,000 have been captured in the present offensive, labeled Operation Mercury. Swift, effective, and humanitarian, unlike the treatment meted out by the Reds to their prisoners. War comes to peaceful rice paddies, rich prize the Reds were hoping to seize, until the French, aided by the loyal Vietnamese, drove them into the sea. But from the backwaters of war come the helpless victims of aggression, the women, the children, the old and infirm. Communism passed their way. They have little left now but a spark of life that drives them on toward escape and sanctuary behind the French line. Some of them are childishly grateful in their thanks at being alive. War is not all guns and glory. In the greatest recorded flood of its history, the Missouri River sweeps through seven Midwestern states, leaving 75,000 persons homeless with its crest not yet reached. Frantic efforts are made to build makeshift sandbag dikes as the rising waters engulf one town after another. The foundations of buildings are also shored to prevent undermining. Designated as a disaster area, every available type of craft is rushed to the scene for the rescue of maroon victims. Governors of the affected states have appealed to Washington for federal aid. In addition to the millions in damage to cities and towns, Hundreds of thousands of acres of rich farmland have been made into a sea of mud. The urgency of flood control is dramatically pointed up. The Easter lilies bloom in New York in spite of a cold, wet Sunday. And the Easter bonnets burgeon along Fifth Avenue. If you were wise, you wore your longies to keep off the goosebumps or hunted up to a bunny in the Easter parade. Everyone is all dogged out on this happy occasion, but as usual, the center of attraction to the crowds that throng the avenue is the bonnet. What would Easter be without a lovely millinery creation to wear and to compare with those worn by others equally fortunate? These, of course, are very select, but they need not be styled by top designers. All that is necessary is that each lady have a brand new top piece to greet the season. Sometimes your platter takes on a topical tone and is in harmony with the time. 
If there's any question about who came first, the egg or the chicken, the answer is yes. All in all, it was a doggone good Easter in spite of the weather. The chick chicks were out hatching plans for a brighter spring. Weighty matters are on the agenda in New York where a spectator holds her breath and Olympic hopefuls compete for a berth on the United States weightlifting team. Heading the list of selections in the heavyweight division is John Davis of Brooklyn. He's undefeated in world competition, and that includes the last Olympic Games for the past 14 years. Also on the agenda, the Mr. America contest, with 35 husky he-men competing for the right to be known as the possessor of the most manly physique in all the land. Selection is made on the basis of symmetry and proportions, muscular development, general appearance, and posing. No comment. We'll leave it to the girls. When he turns around, you'll be looking at Mr. America face to face. The mighty mark of muscle is James Park of Chicago, Illinois. Looking at Mr. America makes me wish I'd kept up with my dumbbells. Lovely Piper Laurie of Hollywood sets the stage at Long Beach, California for the selection of the world beauty who will win a starring contract with Universal International. Miss Laurie introduces the contestants from 30 nations, seeking the title of Miss Universe, most beautiful girl in the world. First in evening gowns, the international lovelies parade before the judges experienced in appraising beauty from every land. Dressed now in bathing attire, the shapely envoys of goodwill are really in the beauty swim. A Caribbean charmer is Gladys Lopez, Miss Cuba. From Gay Paris comes Claude Godard. Miss Italy is Sophie Giovanna Mazzotti. Girls from many countries, but all with a single thought. The judges have eliminated all but ten, and here they are, the semi-finalists. It's almost over, and hearts beat a little faster as the moment of decision nears. Five of these bow out, and from the five finalists, Miss Universe is selected. And here she is, Miss Universe, 18 years old, Army Korsela of Finland. The world beauty queen is a golden blonde, 5 feet 5 inches tall, 110 pounds. Presented by Piper Laurie with a jeweled crown, once worn by a Russian empress, she poses with the other finalists, Miss Hong Kong, Miss Hawaii, Miss Germany, and Miss Greece. All hail to Miss Universe, prettiest girl in the world. When year-by-year year returns, atomic testing in the Pacific and the front page news in 1952. Year-by-year year returns to 1952. The top stories making front page news in 1952. 50,000 are stricken by polio epidemic in the U.S. The White House discloses Eisenhower's secret trip to Korea and Soviets oust U.S. ambassador. A closely guarded secret for more than a year. An atomic blast set off on the lonely atoll of Eniwetok, 4,500 miles out in the Pacific, is released to the public to show the devastating effects of the bomb on fighting equipment and all types of buildings. The carefully controlled test was months in the planning by the Atomic Energy Commission and the Armed Forces. Obsolete tanks become guinea pigs for the occasion, as well as buildings, specially reinforced to simulate industrial plants. Almost every type of modern construction takes its place in the most comprehensive test ever conducted to discover for purposes of civilian defense the total effect of the bomb. Even portions of discarded planes are placed in the blast area. Meanwhile, on adjacent Parry Island, scientists of the Atomic Commission carefully check their instruments before the moment of detonation. And the moment is approaching as the seconds tick off. Every electronic control device is functioning smoothly, and the cataclysmic moment is here, a dress rehearsal of a possible future.
experiment an entire success, a success in destruction. As the smoke rises on any resort, the curtain rises on the seeds of man's oblivion. In retrospect, a look back on the sporting scene in 1952. Big news, big crowds, a big year for thrills and excitement. A slow motion study of a favorite striding to victory in the Kentucky Derby. His name, Hill Gale, the classic colt at Calumet Farm. Written by an old hand at Derby Triumphs, Eddie Arcaro. His fifth coming up. Man and Beast romping into turf from Hall of Fame in 1952. A year that saw 37 out of the 47 starters come a cropper in England's pulse-tingling steeplechase, the Grand National. Four and a half miles, 30 grueling obstacles, the road to glory but for one, disaster for most of the others. The favorite has fallen and now 13 is a lucky number for a 10-year-old named Teal, second choice of the 250,000 racing fans. Big day at Aintree, England. Boxing and a new heavyweight champ, Rocky Marciano of Brockton, Massachusetts. Held in the first round by the aging Jersey Joe Walcott, the 28-year-old XGI came back strong. In a drama-packed 13th, a right-handed jaw crusher knocked Jersey Joe loose from his senses and his title. Exit Walcott, enter Rocky Marciano. One punch gained him the richest crown of boxing. A big year in baseball, and the big story in baseball, the Yankees and their winning ways. They did it again with young stars like Mickey Mantle at the plate and veterans like Ali Reynolds on the mound. The American League leaders kept a tight grip on their World Series crown by subduing the Brooklyn Dodgers four games to three. It was their fourth straight world championship under the managerial genius of Casey Stengel. Will it be number five for old Case in 53? Time will tell. Football in 52, a year of upsets for some highly touted titans of the gridiron. But for Michigan State, sparked by Don McAuliffe and other top talent, it was a year of continued successes. Coach Piggy Munn Spartans of Michigan State numbered the upset aces of Notre Dame among their many victims to run their unbeaten spring to 24 and to wind up the season top team of the nation. The Warner Ski Wizards didn't let much grass grow under their bare feet during a busy year, and many a good turn deserved another. With a daring do that bordered upon nonchalance, the aquatic slapsters hurled themselves into the fray with vim and vigor. It was the year of the big school line, and the year of new fame for Stanley Sayers of Seattle. In his slow motion force, Sayers was stopped at 185 miles an hour on the downwind leg of his record-breaking run on Lake Washington. There's also one racing's coveted Gold Cup, established himself as top driver of the world. His feats lured England's famed John Cobb to his death. In his jet-powered crusader, Cobb set out at Loch Ness in Scotland to better Sayers' mark, an attempt fated to end in tragedy. Cobb raced through the measured mile at over 200, and then as a horrified crowd, his wife among them looked on, Disaster. By the time rescuers reached him, Cobb was dead. Once every four years, the Olympics. Winter and summer of 52, the International Sports Festival produced more entries for more nations, more thrills, more records, and more harmony than any of its predecessors. German bombsetters rocketed to victory. Athletes from 30 nations vied for glory in the Winter Games at Oslo. Italy's Zeno Colo took the downhill ski title, while the men's giant slalom crown went to Sten Eriksson of Norway. Andrea Mead Lawrence of Rutland, Vermont, won two gold medals for the American team. Soaring bird-like through space, the poetry of fluid motion in the ski jump. New records and new thrills for the throngs who lined the slopes. And win or lose, a picture of good sportsmanship in action. He lost his balance, he lost his skis, but he never lost his sense of humor. The big story of the Summer Olympics was the participation of Russian teams. The boys who did and died for Uncle Joe brought, along with a temporary smile of good fellowship, their own scoring system. We won, they told the home folks. Everybody else knew who won. 
But everybody else was busy applauding performers like Emil Zetopek of Czechoslovakia, winner of three events in distance for racing. Zetopek's unprecedented triple victory was one of the highlights of the games that saw Uncle Sam's star-spangled athletes achieve their greatest Olympic triumph ever at Helsinki. Another standout thriller was the 100-meter dash, so close the camera had to pick the winner, Cindy Rimacino of New York. Moment of glory for winners, where masked flags on the Olympic torch were backdrops for the final act of sports' greatest drama in a great year for sports. A new queen has been crowned. She is the liner United States, which holds a double Atlantic blue ribbon for speed. The $73 million luxury speedster makes the east-west crossing in three days and 12 hours from England to Ambrose Lightship, cutting nine hours from the record held by the Queen Mary for 13 years. A royal welcome awaits the new monarch in New York Harbor as she steams to her berth. She completes the 2,900-mile run with an average of almost 40 land miles an hour, with a hint from her officers that she had plenty in reserve. President Franklin of the United States Lines and Grover Whalen congratulate Commodore Harry Manning, the skipper, on bringing back to America the Atlantic laurels for the first time in 100 years. A clean sweep for America's new queen of the seas. quiet along Korea's western front, temporarily. First Marine and Rock units plot a surprise attack on communist positions entrenched in the hills near the Panmunjom truce site. The big guns under their camouflage netting open up. Machine guns and bazookas join in the attack. Then the tanks rumble forward. And behind their iron flanks come the flamethrowers. A veil of secrecy hangs over the truce tents at Panmunjom, not far distant. But here, a veil of fire accents our determination to prosecute a war until a truce is at last won. The commies find it hard to double-talk a flamethrower. action, however, takes a backseat headline-wise to an air attack by 500 UN planes on five power plants in North Korea, hitherto spared. The Defense Department films just released show individual sorties of that mass raid which seriously crippled the enemy's war potential. It also brought protests from some of our UN allies, fearful of the war spreading. Our airmen have no such fears. As long as there are targets to hit, they'll hit them hard. That way, they say, wins war. Everyone liked Ike in 1952, when year-by-year year returns the landslide victory of Dwight Eisenhower. Stay with us. Back to year-by-year. Year. When General Dwight Eisenhower was nominated for the presidency, the country was looking for heroes to guide it into a new age. On November 4th, 1952, Americans spoke with a resounding collective voice. Dwight David Eisenhower was elected as the 34th President of the United States. He received 442 electoral votes to Adlai Stevenson's 89. The Republican Party presents a united front following the bitterly contested 25th Republican National Convention. We saw General Eisenhower win over Senator Taft on the first ballot, 845 to 280. The two chief rivals clasped hands in a symbol of party harmony after the senator's announcement that he relinquishes presidential aspirations. A tumultuous convention greets the nomination of the general who has become Mr. Eisenhower following his resignation from the army. A second ovation follows when Senator Nolan of California pays tribute to the vice presidential nominee. And I wish to say to you that I know of no person who could have been selected for this high position and high honor by the Republican Party of the nation than my junior colleague, Senator Richard Nixon of California. Mike's running mate is probably the youngest vice presidential candidate in history. 
Senator Richard Nixon is only 39. The vice presidential nominee, who was the nemesis of Alger Hiss, receives the accolade supreme from his attractive wife. delegates, once divided, cheered to the echo the convention's choice. As he once conducted a crusade in Europe, he now stands on the eve of a political crusade on the home front. An excited convention awaits the official acceptance speech of the man who promises to lead the new crusade. Ladies and gentlemen, you have summoned me on behalf of millions of your fellow Americans to lead a great crusade for freedom in America and freedom in the world. I know something of the solemn responsibility of leading a crusade. I have led one. I I take up this task, therefore, in the spirit of deep obligation, mindful of its burden and of its decisive importance, I accept your summons. I will lead this crusade. Republican hopes soar with the nomination of their two new standard bearers. of the Republican convention died down in Chicago, then a procession of the Democratic all-time greats sets the stage for their nominating conclave. One of the pre-convention frontrunners is Estes Kefauver, crime-busting senator, who arrives accompanied by his wife and supporters after a vigorous campaign in the primaries throughout the nation. Another prominent contender is the South Senator Richard Russell of Georgia. Around him may revolve the controversial civil rights plank in the party's platform. W. Averill Harriman, long a public official in the Democratic administration, has Franklin Roosevelt Jr. as a ruger. A dark horse who has refused to commit himself as a contender is Illinois Governor Adlai Stevenson. But with the big field involved, the convention can only open with a huge question mark. General Eisenhower awaits his running mate, Senator Nixon, at the Wheeling, West Virginia airport, following a week during which the vice presidential candidate's finances were under attack. General Ike's supporters on the observation deck join him in the warm welcome he gives the senator, following his complete accounting given over the air. The meeting takes place after a wholehearted endorsement by the Republican National Committee of the Senator's Conduct. Once again, the GOP closes ranks during one of the most crucial elections in the nation's history. They join hands for the battle against their Democratic opponent, Governor Adlai Stevenson, who receives an enthusiastic welcome in Baltimore, where he addresses a cheering audience of 9,000. The governor expresses himself forcefully on the subject of taxes. I don't like taxes. I doubt if anybody does. I shall do everything I can to reduce it. But I shall make no promises that I know I cannot keep. America speaks at the polling booth from coast to coast as 55 million from all walks of life cast their vote for the 33rd man to become president of the United States. From the farms and urban centers, they pile up the biggest vote in the nation's history. And around America cuts across all party and factional lines to record its verdict. Here is the freest democracy in action. The aged and young bring the cross-section of the people to the expression of their wills in an atmosphere of calm domestic purpose. 
Among the prominent voters is elder statesman Herbert Hoover, last Republican president who cast his ballot in New York. President and Mrs. Truman returned to their home in Independence, Missouri, to vote after a whirlwind campaign on behalf of Democratic candidate Adlai Stevenson. In the village of Half Day, Illinois, near his hometown of Bloomington, Governor Stevenson records his vote after one of the most strenuous campaigns in history. Starting as a political unknown, he became a nationally known figure. In New York, General Eisenhower signs the register early on the morning of Election Day. After an illustrious military career and a fighting political campaign, he stands before the American electorate awaiting their answer. While on the opposite side of the country, his running mate, Richard Nixon, and his wife take their turn at the polls in California. Democratic headquarters in Washington, scene of gloom and defeat, as the sweep to Ike becomes more and more apparent. Men who had worked hard for Governor Stevenson now wait, their spirits numbed, for the soon expected concession of defeat from Springfield, Illinois. It comes soon. Illinois falls to Ike, a sign of the end. It's Eisenhower by a landslide. The greatest plurality of any Republican standard bearer, with 30 million votes, well over 400 electoral votes. At Republican headquarters, a tremendous ovation greets the president-elect and the next first lady. A beaming Ike and a radiant baby. The long campaign is over. The American people have spoken with a resounding voice at the polls. Victory is here. After 20 years, the Republican Party is back in power. General Dwight D. Eisenhower is elected. His party has won control of Congress with the Senate pretty evenly divided. Entering upon the crowning achievement of an already famous career, General Eisenhower humbly accepts the cheers of those who work for him. And as humbly, our new president asks for support from all Americans in the tasks that lie ahead. My friends, it is trite to say that this is a day of dedication rather than of triumph. But I am indeed as humble as I am proud uh, by the, of the decision uh, that the American people have made. And I recognize clearly the weight of the responsibilities uh, you have placed upon me, and I assure you that I shall never, in my service in Washington, give short weight uh, to those responsibilities. Let us unite uh, for the better future for America, for our children and our grandchildren. And now, my friends, it's been a long and sometimes hard road, but it's been great uh, to meet you people, to work with you, all of us, for a common cause. Good night. All Americans hail their president-elect, their next commander-in-chief, Dwight D. Eisenhower. America monkeys around in space. And what was new in 52, when Year by Year continues. Year by Year returns to 1952. In 1952, Americans were introduced to pocket-sized transistor radios, Kellogg's Sugar Frosted Flakes, and American Bandstand. First films of one of the most amazing rocket experiments to date. At White Sands, New Mexico, Air Force scientists prepare to launch a rocket into upper space manned by two white mice and Albert the monkey. The purpose? To study their reactions to travel at altitudes and speeds never attained by human beings. Every precaution is taken to assure their return, safe and sound, from their spectacular journey into space to the point where the force of gravity measures exactly zero. The final step, inserting a tube of oxygen. Where this rocket is headed, there's no air outside. Zero hour approaches. They're off at 2,000 miles an hour. Special equipment broadcasts Albert's physical reactions back to the test station. Defense Department films show the rocket 38 miles up. Inside the missile, an automatic camera shows the mice running on the sides of their cage. There's no gravity here, no up or down. Notice the floating ball. A parachute opens to ease the rocket and its precious cargo to a gentle landing. 
Anxious scientists rush to the scene and discover the animal crew has weathered the flight safely. It's Albert's moment of triumph. He's the world's first space cadet. In Egypt, exiled King Farouk's stained Kuba Palace is open to the newsreel camera, revealing scenes of fantastic luxury and garishness. Farouk went into exile with over 200 bulging trunks. This is what he left behind in just one of his many palaces. Hundreds of valuable antique toys and clockwork gadgets, favorite playthings of the deposed monarch. In the palace's mirror-lined strongroom, vast stores of wealth were found, surprising even high-ranking Egyptians. Gold ingots, millions of dollars worth of rare stamps and coins, and precious stones by the hundreds. A priceless collection of gems. Bottles from the King's well-stocked bar stand on a table near the professionally equipped gambling room, complete with roulette wheels, dice and card tables, and plenty of chips. By the royal bedside, well-thumbed stacks of American comic books. And in the royal wardrobe, over 100 suits, over 1,000 neckties. This is Kuba Palace, Farouk's legacy to his people. Now we switch to Paris for a visit with the San Filippo family, father and son. At seven months, Junior has created something of a spur in physical culture circles. He hasn't as yet walked by himself, but shades of Samson, what a mighty midget of muscle. Hailing from a long line of vegetarians, though he himself has yet to eat his first spinach, the tiny Tarzan is not lacking in vitamins. Look at him hang on those rings. His daddy's a strong man and baby's a little chip off the block. Folks addicted to spinach are pop-eyed over the small fry athlete. Daddy's a taskmaster, too. Allows no thumb sucking when it's time to concentrate on making like a little ramrod. Get off. Oh. Also from Paris, unchanged over the years, comes a glimpse of the latest fall fashion. Paris may not change, but Paris fashions certainly more. So take a good look, girls, and then make a mental note of the changes to be made in your wardrobe. A sculptured figure is part of the new fashion trend from Paris. The other is the casual line. This may sound far-fetched and contrasting, but then isn't that what the kings of high style intend? There'd be no do-re-mi for them if they sang last year's tune this year. Jean Desay and other leaders of haute couture have labored long and lovingly to make you ladies refer to a current number as that old rag. You'll just have to go shopping, which will please everybody. Well, almost everybody. But then what does a man know about these things? Oh, before I forget, black is the color, the dresses are longer, fringe is rife, and tweed is flourishing. Don't ask me why, I'm only quoting the expert. Paris looks the same, pigeons and all, but the new Paris look is different. May we? Britain's famous Canberra twin jet bomber takes off from Northern Ireland for a record-shattering round-trip Atlantic crossing as a demonstration of the production model's ability. A mere four hours and 34 minutes after takeoff, the RAF plane is refueling in Newfoundland and ready for the return flight, even faster. Another is three hours and 25 minutes, and a new milestone in the history of flight is recorded emblazoned across the sky at an astounding 606 miles an hour average speed. Wing Commander Ronald Beaumont, the pilot, tells the story. We had breakfast at uh, Old Grove in Ireland, and uh, lunch in Newfoundland, and tea back in Ireland. Total flying time, 7 hours, 59 minutes for the 4,000 mile flight. This is Jacqueline Pung of Honolulu, tees off in the women's amateurs at Portland. Her opponent in the finals, Shirley McFedders of Long Beach, gets her drive away. And a gallery of 4,000 trails along as the two gals fight it out for top amateur honors. The California girl, a student at UCLA, sinks a beauty and was five up at one stage of the match. But Mrs. Pung catches up fast on the last round and holds out to win on the 35th green. She came from behind to win. First Hawaiian ever to win the title. she could cry. Before hitting the big town, the ice capades of 1953 thrilled the delighted
Atlantis song with a special preview at Atlantic City's Convention Hall. The chorus cuties, slick cheeks in their kitchen capers routine, enliven the proceedings. Boy and girl in a French frozen number entitled Ballet Apache. The girl is Gloria Pillar. The boy, John Curtin. the United States was still only dreaming about putting a man in space, so we sent a monkey. The race to the stars, along with the arms race, had begun, with the U.S. pitted against the Soviet Union. But Americans felt unbeatable in 1952, convinced that the USA was the center of the universe. When newsreel cameras went into exiled King Farouk's palace in Egypt, they showed the obligatory shot of the monarch's priceless jewels but lingered on his collection of American comic books. This has been Year by Year. I'm Karen Stone for the History Channel. And now, a History Channel news fact. Timeline, 1902. The first teddy bear is created, named after U.S. President Theodore Roosevelt. Stay tuned for more news later on the History Channel.